the school and my colleague John Greenaway, who's also here, will be chairing the discussion after the talk. The idea of the uh, Too Difficult Box series was that of Charles Clark, who, of course, you know as the Home Secretary in Tony Blair's government and, and as MP for Norwich South until 2010, and now here as a visiting professor. And the aim of the lectures, as, as Charles saw them, was to focus on political problems that are, at least on the one hand, too large to ignore, and on the other, apparently impossible to solve, and therefore get consigned to the too difficult box. The questions we ask our speakers in these series to address is what is the nature of this problem that uh, confronts us? Why does it appear to be so difficult, and what, in fact, can be done about it? In the last series, our speakers face the challenges posed by climate change, pensions, nuclear disarmament, and party political funding. In this series, the challenges are equally daunting. Gender discrimination, defence, immigration, political power, and today, long-term social care. It is a great pleasure to be introducing Lord Lipsy to speak on this topic. In 1998, he was appointed to the Royal Commission on Long-Term Care of the Elderly. Indeed, he is no stranger to difficult problems of various kinds, having also served on the Jenkins Commission on Electoral Reform and the panel chaired by Gavin Davis on the BBC's licence fee. He is now chair, as it happens, of the pressure group Straight Statistics, whose task is to detect and expose the distortion and misuse of statistical information by the media, amongst others. As I say, he is no stranger to the world of the difficult and the demanding. As David Lipsy, he had a distinguished career within the Labour Party and the Fabian Society. He was a political advisor to Anthony Crossland when Labour was in opposition, and then worked in the Prime Minister's office under James Callaghan. As a leading journalist, he's written for The Times and The Sunday Times, among others. And in 1997, he was awarded a special George Orwell Prize for political writing for his contributions uh, to the Badgett com column in The Economist. He's also the author of several books on policy and politics. And he has served as a Labour peer since 1999. It is with great pleasure, then, that I introduce you to Lord Lipsy to speak on the question and the difficult problem of long-term care for the elderly. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, John, and it's a, a very real pleasure for me to be here tonight. It's a university I've always uh, heard very good things of, um, and uh, it's lovely to see the, the actual campus and the actual place and to meet some of the actual people and to be uh, confirmed in that belief. It's also a great pleasure to be able to start a speech other than by saying, my lords. Um, in fact, last week it got worse than that because there was actually a vote in the House of Lords on the following. When you referred in speech to another lord, could you simply say, Lord Street? Or did you have to say the noble lord, Lord Street? The vote was tied with 173 peers in each lobby. I'm a f fear that I had an appointment to see the Sacconi String Quartet and decided to put that ahead of the vote. So uh, it, the fact that we will now go on calling each other noble lords is entirely my fault. <laughs> hey ho, there are, there are better sides for the lords. Um, and uh, it, it's also nice to be able to speak uh, in something other than the, the red benched chamber where if you take a step to the side and go into the aisle, you're shouted down by cries of order. I mean, this is a great traditional British bill. The idea you'd have a PowerPoint uh, presentation, of course, is regarded as utterly uh, beyond the pale. You are allowed to have a computer in the chamber now, so long as you don't use it to access any papers which have any relevance to the debate in front of the House. You can use it for any other purpose. <coughs> um, Long, long, long term care is my difficult issue this evening. Um, well, actually, I rather like the, the variant on, uh, long, on difficult adopted by the great modern historian and now member of my house, uh, Lord Hennessy. Peter dubs 
these issues wicked issues, which follows the terminology of the 1973 paper by Horst Rittel and Melvin Weber, though I have to say I haven't read it, but I'm told that's where it comes from. This is, of course, to avoid any misunderstanding, wicked in the original sense, not in the sense of well wicked, as used, I'm told, by the young to indicate approbation. Now, Charles kicked off this, this series by giving us a number of characteristics uh, of wicked, wicked issues, which I'm going to refer to in my talk. I'll just rattle through them. Solution needs to be clearly identified. Challenge of implementing that solution needs to be understood. A variety of vested interests need to be placated or overcome. A range of legal constraints need to be circumnavigated. The international dimension of the problem has to be appreciated. The vicissitudes of the political process need to be undergone. By God, they need to be undergone. And government needs to sustain the political energy and creativity, which is essential if change is to be successfully accomplished. A veritable uh, grand national, then, where every fence is Beecher's Brook. So here we come to my long-term issue, um, long-term care of the elderly. I spent an eye-watering proportion of my time thinking about this since I was appointed to the Royal Commission on the Funding of the Long-Term Care of the Elderly in 1998, for reasons which are still slightly obscure to me. Um, and I wish I could say 13 years later that we have definitively cracked it, though um, Ruth Hancock out there, who's been in, in it from the beginning, will know that we have made some progress I will describe. And why is this issue so bloody difficult? I'm going to explore it against the, this set of criteria that Charles set out. But before I go that, I think I'd better go over the history. Even among uh, intelligent people, understanding of this issue is not great for a reason that is part of the difficulty of it. Not many people want to think about it. I think it's been worth being involved from my point of view, but it's given me uh, some... some you know, unpleasant times, because it isn't a nice subject. Perhaps that's another feature of some difficulties. It's not a nice subject. You know, like like disarm, uh, thinking of bombs falling on people isn't a nice subject. Thinking of the last years of your life is not a nice issue, which is why the public uh, generally cheerfully ignores it. But what is the issue? Well, actually, um, there are two separate issues which become interwoven. The first is this. More and more people live for a long time. We know that. They used to die young. Immediately post-war, the average bloke lived till he was 69. It was a bit longer for women. And you know, so you, you retired uh, four years on the, in front of the fire, and then you popped it. And the problem of long-term care was quite manageable because um, where it was possible, while it was possible, families cared. And when that became impossible, care was provided by the state, yes, but in horrible, ghastly, geriatric wards in hospital. And anyone thinks we've made no progress, they should think back to what those wards were like. Today, this is what everybody knows, this, people live much longer. There's also a fierce uh, um, argument, including an academic argument, on the following. Is the period for which people are sick at the end of their lives, because nearly anybody, everybody is, you know, we all hope to die of a heart attack in the middle of our last round of golf, but it's, it's not often always like that. Is the period for which people are seriously sick at the end of life lengthening, shortening, or remaining much the same? There's a whole academic uh, literature on this. Some say it's shorter, some say it's longer, some say it's roughly constant. But this determines whether the problem we face is big or absolutely enormous. I mean, imagine a world, and it may not require as much imagination as it once did, where, where doctors could actually keep people alive forever, but they couldn't slow their physical deterioration. I mean, it would be costly, though that wouldn't be the only th pro problem of it. It would be a very difficult situation to deal with. So that is part of the difficulty, is not knowing which of that is true. The other difficulty very much on the, on the cost side of it is this, that people demand better standards of care. And rightly so. 
We've been brought up, and this will be even truer of the generation to which I belong, brought up in an age of autonomy where individuals are entitled to freedom to seek their own fulfilment in their own way. Now, it's true that in extreme old age capacity tends to diminish, but rights do not diminish, and people deserve uh, to be uh, helped to live a life that are enabled to live as fully as possible. It's good news that people live longer, and it's important that they are able to use that longer life to the full. As the numbers needing care grow, the forms it can take have diversified greatly. You can stay in your own home using increasingly telecare, which tells somebody if you fall over, with or without the support of paid or family carers. Residential care, nursing care, which is sort of residential care with a nurse on tap to do nursing functions. In too many cases, hospital care, because even though the geriatric wards have gone, too many old people go into hospital after having fallen, broken hip, and they never get out again, and it is not a pleasant thing to do. Now, all this leads to increasing pressure on public spending with the usual consequences. For example, many councils used to provide support with care uh, to people who were living at their own home, but they only had moderate care needs. You know, they, they, maybe they needed a meal cooked or something like that. Today, fewer and fewer councils supply care unless the needs of the individual are substantial or critical. So they've got more and more people, no more money, so they, they, they only provide it for those whose needs are substantial or critical. And this has the side effect, the unintended consequence, if you like, because the people's moderate needs are not catered for, so they deteriorate, and they pass more rapidly to the substantial or critical care where they may need much more expensive care in residential homes. So that is a very nasty um, uh, uh, development which will increase the cost in the end. Now that's, that's one side, what services we're providing for people in their last years. But that wasn't the one that my Royal Commission was set up to study. Royal Commission was about something rather different, though related, and that was the funding of long-term care. Who pays for care in the last years, the state or the individual and their family? The, the post-war beverage settlement provided an NHS which was broadly free at the price point of consumption. But contrary to what many people thought and still think, it did not, stop, repeat not, provide free social care. Social care was provided on a means-tested basis, and a pretty peculiar means test it is too. Basically what happens is, if your assets are below £23,250, and you need residential care, the council will pay. The moment you go above that, all your assets have to go to paying for your own care. So the better off have to pay for residential care services. And this leads to increasingly to very difficult border areas because people are very keen to get cared for by the National Health Service, which is free, rather than by uh, personal care services, which they have to pay for. There's now a huge case law on this issue, tremendous um, campaigns go on, for example, a dementia lobby, and I quite understand this, argue that dementia is not a social care problem, it's a health problem and should be paid for by the state. So there's a sort of mess there. Now, when you aren't being cared for at home, there's a further problem, and that is if you go into care, the value of your home is taken into account for the means test. So if you own a home and it's worth more than £23,500, and at least until the uh, Euro crash has gone around a bit further, most of our homes are worth more than £23,250, um, your, your, your home is taken into account in calculating your assets. So does anyone here read the Daily Mail? I didn't think anybody would confess. <laughs> My mum says she reads it only for the crossword. <laughs> Anyway, the Daily Mail is full of stories about middle-class old people having to sell their homes to pay for care. This makes it a political issue. Prudent, who save for old age, who are alleged to be the losers. The feckless, who spent their way through their assets cruising the world and um, going to old, old, old people's discotheques. They were the winners. Now, actually, um, this bears little resemblance to the real world. Most people who have their care, pay, care paid for 
are people who've been poor all their lives. Probably haven't got a house. They never had the chance. But hey, we are talking the Daily Mail here, and as far as politicians generally are concerned, there is no higher form of truth than the uh, Daily Mail, at least it was the highest form of truth before the phone hacking scandals began. But I'm not saying they hacked any phones because they'll sue, well, they'll have to. But uh, the, 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 the Daily Mail is, and it is a truth because, of course, people believe what they read and therefore they believe that they are having to pay for their care where the feckless are getting it free. So this has been going for quite a long time, this, this sort of campaign, and the Labour Party felt that they needed a policy on it for the 1997 general election. However, they hadn't got a clue what that policy should be, and quite reasonably. And so instead of having a policy, they said they'd set up a Royal Commission to look into it, and it was set on, up under the chairmanship of Sir Stuart Sutherland, now Lord Sutherland, a philosopher of religion. I was asked to sit on it. For the majority of the commission, it turned out that this wasn't a difficult issue at all. They prescribed making personal care, like health care, free at the point of use. And this position is perfectly logical. It's logical, but as the minority report, which I signed and uh, Lord Joffe signed, pointed out, uh, it's completely unworkable to. Incidentally, if anyone asks you to go on to the Royal Commission, could I recommend that you sign a minority report? It's very unpleasant at the time, I'll come back to that. But the only Royal Commission reports that had any impact are minority reports dating back to uh, Beatrice Webb's minority report to the 1906 Royal Commission on the Poor Law. There's no point signing a majority report. We always sign a minority report, so you may not get into that thing. Now, why was, why was the proposal that it be free um, hopeless? It was unaffordable. What is more, most of the extra spending, which was considerable, goes to the better off because they were paying for themselves, not to the worse off. It would preempt funds that might otherwise be used to improve the very inadequate standards of care at the bottom, and particularly, so particularly the worse off would lose. Now, something very interesting happened on this, which is that you've got something you practically never have in social policy, which is a controlled experiment. Because Westminster said, no, we can't possibly do this. But the Scots decided they would have free care, or a sort of variant of free care. We can go into ways that differed from the majority's report if you want. So we have this rare example of two rival policies being tried in comparable jurisdictions. I would say this, wouldn't I? But the result is game, set, and match to the minority. The cost of free care at home in Scotland has escalated absolutely hugely from 133 million in 2003-04 to 318 million, that's sort of two and a half times over, in 2009-10. This is something that just doesn't happen with, with public spending programmes. And, and it's going on every year, escalating in that way. Now, Jill and I wouldn't have been surprised at that because one of the things we pointed out was that if you cut the price of something from quite a lot to zero, the amount of it that's demanded goes up from zero to quite a lot. Um, that's not the limit to what happens in Scotland. It's underfunded, of course, by the Scottish government. So care payments are, in effect, rationed by queue. The local authority says, yes, you're entitled to free care, but we can only come around to see you to ensure that's true. And we've got a long queue, and you may be nine months, 12 months. With any luck, the person is dead before they get round to having to pay for it. And even, even Lord Sutherland, with whom I have, to put it mildly, had my disagreements, has come round to the view this is now unaffordable. At the time of the Royal Commission, um, the, the relations between the minority and the majority were pretty toxic, really. Um, they, were, they were very cross with us for not signing their report, and we were very cross with them for having decided what their report would say before we'd heard any of the arguments. Um, look, I, I, I say this in defence of the, the majority of the Commission. They didn't get to grips with cost issues because they weren't qualified to think about them. I mean, this was a Commission set up to consider the funding of long-term care, as I've said, not to 
consider the, the, uh, the um, standards of long term care or how it should be organised or whatever. So who did they put on it? Doctors, nurses, I should apologise to my wife in advance because she has one, but a social worker. Not a single professional economist. I had to pretend to be an economist throughout in order to, to, to fill this gap. No expert in public finance. Nobody knew anything about taxes and spending or anything of that kind. Now, I'm a great admirer of the caring professions. I think they you know, do an absolutely crucial and wonderful job. But in my experience, they generally take the view that the solution to their problems is more money for their particular service. And that was true of the majority of the commissioners. There apparently was a, a tree growing in Whitehall which had 20 pound notes dropping off it and whose size was enormous and from which the money could be painlessly plucked to pay for free care. There's another sort of failure of the commission which made things the difficult issue even worse. We were given a complete impossible, completely impossible timetable which was, um, went like this. It took ministers, as it usually takes ministers, a very long time to get round to setting up the commission that they had promised. Months and months and months went by. And so people were starting to accuse them of kicking the issue into the long grass. So ministers thought, oh, can't be accused of that. What we'll do is give them a very rapid timetable. They said, do it within a year. And that's why the, the, the majority reached this adaptive strategy of reaching the conclusion first and then collecting the evidence afterwards, spray on evidence, as David Halpern of the Institute's government has dubbed this approach. You know, that, that was the only way you could get through it. Um, it's a very, very hard subject. It includes all sorts of human and economic and uh, social considerations. It's the hardest subject, you know, just intellectually, if I've ever come across, and uh, that trying to do that, get your head around that in a year, was, was killing, especially if you didn't have the training in economics that was so much part of it. So Sutherland came out, got practically zero publicity, at least the majority report did, and um, uh, ministers said they weren't going to do it. At various attempts to revive the issue, because <laughs> at the same time, you know, the politicians find people coming up who are having to sell their house or complaining that the neighbours getting it free more often, and so there are various attempts to deal with it. Derek Wanless, who did the health inquiry later, did a, uh, a, an inquiry into long-term care, which is quite a good report in every respect, except that it, too, cost far too much money. He did come up with a very fertile area, though, which is that there should be some sort of partnership between individuals and the state in providing this. Um, uh, there were, however, also some catastrophic interventions, the worst of all being by the then Prime Minister, I don't know if any of you remember him, he was a man called Gordon Brown. He was... His government was consulting on a cautious and quite good uh, green paper setting out possible ways forward and ruled out free care and embraced the partnership concept. Then Brown, whose policy ideas outside economics were consistently half-baked, decided to cut the Gordonian knot and he announced at Labour Party conference that care would be free to elderly people living at home. This totally contradicted his own government's green paper published a few months before I... I've described it publicly as the first recorded instance of an admiral firing an exocet into the flagship of his own fleet, a phrase I was gratifyingly asked to reprise on just about every news programme thereafter. <laughs> it had taken some polishing, so it needed a good outing. But you know, the shambolic handling of the part policy was only part of the problem. It was terribly expensive. Government told complete porkies about how it would be funded, Lord Butler, the former cabinet secretary, a man who weighs his words carefully, described it in the Lords as an act of national economic sabotage. It's grotesquely unfair because what happened, of course, is that somebody would stagger by in their own home, you know, making do, and their care would be paid for, any help was coming in. And then the terrible day would come, and it is for many people the worst day of their life, when they had to leave their home and go into care. And on the day that they went into care, somebody would have to say to them, oh, and by the way, you're going to have to pay for this absolutely in full. Getting it free before, don't get it free now you've gone in. And the sense of sort of failure and injustice that that would have begotten is almost unbelievable. Fortunately, the House of Lords, which does have its uses, despite all this talk about noble lords, has its uses. And in this case, uh, the, the government lost the, the vote in Parliament before it took effect. And the general election removed Mr Brown 
and that was the last we heard of this. Um, I, I, I should say, too, that the Brown government wasn't the only one that behaved badly on this. The Tories, um, uh, there was a, sensible, a potentially sensible idea that long-term care, there should be some scheme of insurance for long-term care funded by some increase in inheritance tax. You'd think that was the death tax posters put up because Andrew Lansley, who had been up to them very sensible, was told that he wasn't making enough out of this issue. And that was, again, absolutely outrageous political time uh, bomb put off, uh, or let off underneath uh, sensible policy. There was a sort of effort to get consensus, even despite these events. Because when you think about it, on long-term care, consensus is terribly important for this reason. None of us is going to need long-term care, nobody in this room for probably 20 or 30 years, even the older amongst us. So you need to be able to plan for the future. Well, it's impossible to plan if this year's policy is Brown's free care at home and next year's policy is Tory private insurance and that the policy yours about between the two. So you know, it really is crucial that you have consensus as to the way forward. And we did try and get a measure of consensus. I set up a little group um, backed by Bupa, which included Lord Warner as a Labour peer, um, who is very prominent in this field, Stephen Dorrell, a former Tory health secretary, Julia Neuberger, a Lib Dem. Um, all of us knew a bit about long-term care, and we, we, we produced a, an agreed report. But the Brown era and the Lansley era meant that it couldn't go very far. However, however, one good thing did come out of it, and that was the inquiry set up, chaired by Andrew Dilnot, then principal of St. Hugh's Oxford, um, and which reported in July 2011. Now, I won't try and summarise in detail the, the um, Dilnot report, but it had two crucial elements. One was, as already discussed, partnership. Neither individuals paying everything, nor the state paying everything, but some measure of cooperation. And secondly, and this came out more clearly, I think, in Dilnot than anything ever before, uh, that there is in this an element of insurance. I mean, when you t if you take residential care alone, only one in three men, roughly speaking, are ever going to need it. One in, uh, one in three women, sorry, one in five men. So men drop down dead. And men uh, don't do the things that cause you to drop down dead. So you need some form of insurance, some form of risk pooling, and that was Andrew's um, uh, insight. Uh, it wasn't very, it's not very easy to find an insurance system that deals with this because private insurers have been very reluctant to get into the business because they don't know that those doctors won't keep us living forever and bankrupt their insurance companies paying for it. So the Dilnot solution was to impose a cap. Up to the level of that cap, you had to pay for yourself. Beyond that, um, sorry, up to, the level, uh, up to the level of the cap, you pay for yourself. Beyond that, however, the state would pick up the tab not free from difficulty, that solution, but it's a good idea. And it also means insurance companies know they're not going to have to pay out more than well, 35 or 50,000 on, on Dilnot's views. Um, but um, so their, their risk is capped, and therefore it is viable for private insurance to be made available. Is, has Dilnot licked the wicked issue, this wicked issue? We don't know. Uh, government has promised a white paper for next Easter. Uh, the parties are sort of moving like two dancers at a dance who aren't sure if they fancy each other yet uh, towards talking about talks um, and therefore consensus is possible. However, it is extremely uh, difficult in this sense. There isn't any public money for anything at the moment and finding what under deal not will be an extra 3.4 billion by 2025-26. This is, this is extremely hard. So it is still possible. Well, Dilnot says there's an 80% chance that his report is um, going to be adopted. And if he uh, offered me four to one against it not being adopted, I would go to the bank, take out such savings as I have, and place them all upon that as a four to one bet. Uh, I, I think that the chances are probably less than 50-50, to be honest. Okay.
go, go back a bit. That's the, that's the his, potted history. I guess I'll expand on anything anyone wants me to. Let's go back to Charles's list of the seven things. Or at least before I do that, I just want to add a couple of things to Charles's list which apply very much in this case, but I think apply to very many wicked, wicked issues. One is the issue of resources and the determination of priorities in the use of resources. And I was in government from 74 to 79, and this is mostly what ministers are doing, spend their time talking about. But it's especially true given the fiscal crisis of the state, given the reluctance of taxpayers to pay, it's getting worse and worse and more and more difficult uh, to extract more by way of tax. That is why, uh, though people still want decent services, that's why whenever you see a minister talk, he says, oh, we have to cut the deficit and therefore we're having to cut spending. But of course we're not touching frontline services. We're, push we're getting rid of the pen pushers and the bureaucrats. This is, this is usually arrant nonsense. There aren't many of them. They don't cost that much. And if you don't have them, there'll be even more waste than there is at the moment. But unfortunately, it seems to fool the public quite often, or at least the politicians believe it fools the uh, public. Um, and uh, so th that's the way in which they do it. So, so uh, th there is the problem of resources really is critical to this. And it's particularly true because well-being as it is, there's a bit of a choice between whether you spend the money available to government on paying for services for people, so that the rich are better off, don't have to pay, or whether you spend it on better services themselves. As I said, local authority services are, are withering on the vine, less and less care available for more and more people, and that is a very difficult priority uh, choice. So the, the contradictory nature of the public's views and the politicians' um, desire to, to play with them is, is really a very serious problem in this case. And of course, it, you know, it also under uh, the, the, the Royal Commission members, they didn't have a problem. They didn't have to raise the taxes. They just spent the money. But if you're a politician, you have to be aware of the tax implications. And the, uh, that is a very major difficulty here. There's another difficulty, it's just worth mentioning, and I've been 40 years since I first went into House of Parliament working for the then um, Shadow Environment Secretary, Anthony Crossland. The biggest change almost in our entire political life is the decline of the civil service. I mean, this is caricature, but in a way what used to happen is that the civil service used to do the policy, or at least input hugely into policy with, with ministers listening to them. And then it was ministers to find a way to sell a correct policy. It's an exaggeration, but not wholly. Now, the minister and their special advisors, I used to be one, so I have to be careful, but their special advisors dream up the policy and they tell the civil servants, go off and implement this. Um, this is not a good balance for the point of view of an effective democratic uh, society. Um, Political advisors, incidentally, are no more elected than our, our civil servants. But the idea that this is a gain for democracy, that the minister gets out of his bath in the morning and decides what the policy will be on the basis of, um, sadly, unfortunately, little, little uh, consideration. And very often, because of what a story in the Daily Mail or The Sun or something has said that morning, this is a serious deterioration in our national life that makes these difficult issues even more difficult. Uh, the, other, the other dimension, which also applies to lots of these others I've already referred to, which is time scale. The political cycle is five years. Or actually, it's worse than that, because most politicians now conduct themselves as if there's always going to be a general election next day. And if they don't get the right line on this today, and if they are criticised for this today, gosh, the voters will be gone uh, tomorrow. They haven't got the nerve they used to have. But of course, um, uh, so, so that things are decided to last for a very short time. And the Labour government had a particular device, which was Gordon Brown's own, sorry, I mustn't go on about him, but I can't help it, um, which was just announcing a policy which we never then heard anything further about. But it was announced, and that dealt with today's problem. But as I said, this is a problem that requires really long-term, consistent thinking on the best of the best possible information. 
This is a particular case of that, but it's true of all sorts of issues that short-termism is very inimical to solving uh, problems of extremely fundamental national importance. Okay, I'll get to Charles's list finally, which you thought I'd forgotten, sorry. Um, some of his lists don't apply very much to this. There aren't great internationally imposed difficulties on long-term care. It is a matter of domestic policy. There is an international dimension in that it's a policy area which all modern societies have to struggle with and which international experience can highlight some useful policy ideas. Um, but um, other people haven't cracked it either. At the time of the Royal Commission, uh, we on the minority were told that we were completely wrong because the Japanese and the Germans had cracked it. They'd got a perfect system involved paying for it for everybody. Well, the predictable thing happened. The Japanese and the Germans found they couldn't afford it and they cut back. So what it appeared to be a solid consensus-based system is being cut back all the time. They haven't solved it any better than we have. Nor really to take another item from Charles, is there legal constraints on us? Not very much. European law, not very much. Domestic law, not very much. Uh, there's an excellent report from the Law Commission on social care law, which will deal with a lot of the problems that do exist. They're not the really serious problems, no. but there are some problems on his list that really are important. Now, the first item on his list was the need for the solution to be clearly identified. I, I, I rather balk at solution in the case of long-term care. It, it, it isn't something. You can have a settlement, but you can't have a solution. There isn't a solution that gives everybody everything they want. What you have to have is a soundly based settlement which can be uh, carried forward. Uh, but this certainly is a difficulty. I mean, as I said, this really, this is really is a mind-bogglingly difficult area, and I've simplified to an extent that if anybody well, actually Ruth does know about it, who knows about it will, will realise how much I've simplified. You can't do it unless you agree in economics, know all about the sociology of ageing, you need quite a lot of knowledge of uh, gerontology, degree in social statistics, understanding of the welfare state, organisation of social care and acute political antennae, not to mention the skin of a rhino. Such paragons it turns out are in short supply, though Dill not comes quite near to meeting the bill. There is also the difficulty that the data in this field is in short supply. Much of it is dodgy. The unsung heroes of the PSSRU at LSA in tackling this deficit need to be recognised. You, you can ask for the facts, but to establish the facts is very hard. Um, you're also peering into a crystal pool in a minute. In a, in a way. Just to take an example, and I'm certainly not advocating this or, or, or taking any view on it, but does anyone in this room believe that it isn't possible that we're going to have a great national debate at euthana on euthanasia at some time in the next 30 years because some of us don't want to go on living when we've reached a state of acute crumble? I, I, I simply don't. May I finish and then, of course, I'll take questions. Um, now, if a society took a different view on that, it could change the economics of the thing quite severely. It's quite silly. That's not the reason why we should take the decision, a decision one way or the other instantly, but it would change the, the um, solution. Secondly, he identified implementation of the solution. I was talking again with Ruth a bit about this earlier. There are nasty techie bits in, in long-term care. Most notably, if you have a cap, when does the clock start ticking? Does the fact you've got a daily help coming in once a day count as you're starting to consume care or do you need somebody cooking meals or whatever? I don't think they're actually insuperable, but they're, they're, they're testing. Thirdly, he pointed to the difficulty which is raised by a number of vested interests. And there I think we have made some quite good progress. Uh, the the um, pressure groups that all wanted free care for the elderly, none of them do now. For example, Age UK, which consisted of some very raucous um, campaigners in the past, now takes a very intelligent uh, view of long-term care. So if all the political parties can be got to play ball, uh, you could get a consensus solution. But it is always a tricky bit. I've just mentioned the political parties. I mean, it has been a political as well as an intellectual journey, and I've described some of the ways in which it's been 
bugged by the politicians. I didn't mention the Lib Dems, did I? Lib Dems got this all off on completely the wrong foot because one of the reasons the whole thing came into the government's purview was that they adopted a free care policy right in the uh, 70s. Wonderfully, they managed to drop it uh, in the 80s. Uh, wonderfully, they managed to drop it. But that was, that was the start of a great many of the difficulties that we had. Um, and um, getting a political consensus is crucial and very difficult. I'm still quite optimistic, only because of the importance of getting a solution. The, the length of the process of this is terrible. But the pain it causes to real life old people and their families, bombardment of MPs that comes from that, all those sort of things, do make it vital to solve it. And more and more politicians have come round to the view that consensus is the way forward. It's just a question. It, it, it's rather like sort of trying to get wars to end. It's very easy to find out what you think would be a sensible and fair solution and extremely difficult to broker it, which is why we have a United Nations. Uh, finally, and this is where we, we get to where we are now, Charles identified the need for political energy. And here, this is where it's very balanced. You see, it's not just a matter for the Department of Health, who would dearly love, I'm sure, to have a solution. The Treasury has an absolutely major voice. I don't think David Cameron's much addressed it yet, but in the end of the day, it can't not come onto his plate. And I think if I characterize the Treasury attitude, it is it's still too difficult. The government's got an awful lot on its plate at the moment. How is governance to survive the level of cuts we've got? Huge new cost bill, very worrying. Could, who knows what it might end up on? Because with the cap, of course, it's not the insurance companies who will bear the brunt if it goes, care goes on forever. It's the, the, the Treasury. Inevitably, it's not going to give people what they really would like, so it's going to be unpopular. And then you've got bloody big bill in Parliament. I mean, after the health bill, it's going to be quite hard to get 400 pages of it, get a bloody big bill on health, social care. You want to communicate it to the public, who, as I said, don't want to think about it. You want to get the financial services industry geared up, and they're, they're um, in, in two or three minds about it. And you're always worrying that you'll set off on this journey and suddenly one or other of the other political parties will say, oh, the government's messing this up, we can make capital out of it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy or necessarily an attractive bit of business if you're, you're sitting in the Treasury. And it remains to be seen if we can overcome these difficulties. But I just say this, if they aren't overcome, very much more will be lost than many years of hard thinking by many well-meaning and dedicated people. What will be lost is the prospect of security in their old age for our people, for all of us come to that, under a system that is fair and comprehensible. And so to fail will be the wickedest thing of all. Thank you very much. Well, thanks ever so much, uh, uh, David. I thought that, that was uh, really got us off to a fantastic, splendid start um, here. And um, it's a difficult problem, but you've, you've really analysed it with tremendous clarity for us. Now, we've got, we've got uh, quite a bit of time for uh, uh, questions. And we've got um, two, two uh, roving mics uh, here, Henry over there and Vanessa over there. So if you put up your... Your hands. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, we'll um, we'll take some questions. Um, we take there's one. There's also a gentleman there. Yes. Who I refuse to let you o okay. Uh, uh, Shall we take? we we'll take. We take I think we will take them in, yes. in threes. So okay. the gentleman, gentleman there, and then the gentleman who. Do you want to? Uh, it? Oh, okay. Right, okay. Uh, I think was, there was someone over there next, and was there a third one? We saw. Okay, we we take those and the, and and Ruth down there. Yes, so we we take them in those orders. Yes, sir. I understand that you're speaking mainly from a national perspective here, of course, 
but I'm a caseworker for a large national military charity looking after a very large number of old soldiers, and I've been personally involved in the care of, well, over 250 cases in this area over the last seven years, so I have some experience. What worries me is that whenever you get government schemes and systems, the cost imposed by the private care providers seems to always rise to the maximum. It's not just this, it's housing benefit and other things as well. For instance, I've been looking after an elderly gentleman. When I provide care for him myself, I can do it for eight pounds an hour, seven to eight pounds an hour. When I ask the county council to do it, as I had on one occasion when his carer was on holiday, that cost rose to over 15 pounds and 25 pence an hour. And even allowing for the better terms of service for the civil servants and the administrative costs the county would need, and the fact, of course, that they place that care with a private firm, it, it seems an enormous difference. And I've noticed this with care homes as well, where we are now raising the RAF Benevolent Fund, the, the, the Army Benevolent Fund, and so on, raising money in, in top-up fees. Because even though we have cases where the people have less than the 23,000, very considerably less than the 23,000, nevertheless, the county is unable to place them in reasonably decent homes within their own cost parameters, and we're constantly begging for 30 pounds a week top up and so on. So I'm a little bit worried about the cascading of these costs down the system and wonder if you could comment on it. Hello, my name's James. I'm Assistant Director of Social Services in Norfolk, actually. And um, we, we spend a lot of our time at the moment uh, trying to uh, introduce personalization and personal budgets and trying to uh, enable people to be consumers of care and to uh, provide consumer protection to them. And, I, and uh, it's supposed to blur the line, I, I guess, between state aid from uh, us as local authorities and people's own wallets, their own you know, personal budgets in the sense of their own money. And I wondered what you thought the role of um, personalization and uh, consumerism uh, 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 is going to be in the future. Is that a, is that a positive development? Uh, how do you see that going? Uh, thank you for that uh, interesting talk, David. Um, you alluded in your analysis of the um, majority recommendation of the Royal Commission, you alluded to the fact that if the state spends more on relieving people from having to spend their own money on care, that is at the expense of improving, say, the quality of care or the amount of care that we can provide. And it's, it's striking to me that both the Royal Commission and the Dilnock Commission were commissions on the funding of care. Do you think there is um, mileage in trying to think about both the funding of care and the quality and quantity of care that we provide together. I have a vain hope that people might be prepared to spend more of their own money on care if they were getting something that they wanted. Um, just, just starting with that, I mean, I, I agree the two have to be taken together, that there, there are quite a lot of problems with doing so, partly that different skill sets uh, are required to, to, to know about uh, each of them. Yes, I mean, I think a lot of this is about teasing people's own money out of their pockets. I mean, there's a conversation that you hear all the time, which is 50-year-old to mum, Look, use your money to buy somebody to come in and help cook your breakfast. You know, my husband and I will be all right. You'll still be, you know, got some money to do. No, no, dear, I want to leave it for you to have it all. Uh, and, that, you know, and therefore turning to the, turning to the state of it. Uh, we, 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 what, one of the biggest unmet needs for care is among better off people who simply refuse to spend their money on it. Um, and the, the, the personalization agenda, to come on to that, I mean, I, I'm a fan of personalization in, in broad principle. I mean, it's very interesting in Germany at one stage, they said, you can have X Deutschmarks in cash, or you can have two X Deutschmarks in care services, double the money. To their astonishment, nearly everybody took the money. Because, I mean, and if you think about this, you can see how it comes about. See, 
we tend to think, the institutions tend to think of care, you know, as the bathing or whatever. The number of old people you have who say, oh, I don't know, I can go on, I can't do the garden anymore. Now, you might say it's more important they took a bath than that the garden was done. But if it's not having the garden done that's making them unhappy, that seems to me to be an important factor, the autonomy. And it's not for us to tell them. I think that, um, uh, from, a, from a socialist point of view, um, one of the most important things is to bring together some sort of advice function which combines various elements. I, I, I'll illustrate this for a story. I went to West Sussex um, the other week to open their new advice service. Now, West Sussex is an interesting area because what happens is people get old in London. They don't want to live in London anymore. They need care, and it's cheaper to buy cut care in West Sussex than it is to buy it in, in London for all the reasons we know about the London. So they moved down to West Sussex. So whereas, generally speaking, uh, about 60% of people in residential homes, for example, are funded by the state, in West Sussex it's very much lower. They're nearly all people paying for themselves. But getting the advice you need is terrible because the council will tell you about what services they can provide and they'll tell you perhaps about care homes and they'll say you know, what um, they know about care homes, but they know about the care homes that can do it on a council budget, best of all, which is very low in, indeed. And um, what they've done in West Sussex is put together, really excellent council officers done this, council's advice services with third sector, relevant to yours, third sector input and independent advisors who specialise in this field. I'm, in fact, president of SOLA, the Society of Later Life Advisors, which is a body that advises people. Now, there are, there are solutions which, even among the most educated people, people don't know about. And if I need long-term care tomorrow, I take out an equity mar mortgage on my house without having to put the whole of it up to risk, I buy with that an insurance policy that will pay for my care as long as I need it. So if I die within six months, I lose my money. But if I go on living for 20 years, which some people do, it pays for me. And the problem is solved without much harm to anybody. Why, is, why aren't there many of these policies solved? Because most people haven't heard of them. They don't know about these solutions. And I think that the councils who do the best jobs for their people are going to be those who do what West Sussex has done and bring these advice services together promote them, use the third sector to promote them so that people can get holistic advice from a single point in a um, comprehensible form. I agree with your point that the system, sort of, quite a lot of money gets down, goes down the, the plug hole in bureaucratic <coughs> systems. I mean, particularly caring for people in their own homes, this doesn't require huge organisations. It requires small organisations with a dedicated person who's to say, who says to themselves, well, I know how I can make a good living and do something really good for society, a retired nurse or something, and they provide these organisations to provide home care. If you put them together with the telecare providers, you can have very, very good solutions at relatively uh, economic cost. The one thing I think is not true is that on the whole, um, the providers of service, particularly residential services, are ripping us off. I mean, actually, the level of bankruptcy among residential services has doubled. And yes, I know there's a Southern Cross refinancing thing, but Southern Cross went belly up. And what's happening there is this. Councils have got no money, so they drive down the amount they're prepared to pay for each old person who goes into care. Now, if you think of it, you're running an old person's home, you've got the, the cost of providing the building, as it were, and the rooms, and then you've got the cost of looking after the old person... Uh, what we as economists call marginal cost and average cost. So what happens is that the local authorities buy at the marginal cost, the rather low cost of just the actual services for the person. But in order to stay in business and cover all their costs, they have to charge someone a good deal more than that. And what they do is they get turned to the self-funders and make them pay over the, over the odds. But uh, that doesn't mean that they're making enormous excessive profits. The, the research by Lang and Buisson into this subject is quite conclusive. Care fees are not adequate to pay for a proper standard of care such as we'd like to see. So I agree with you, have got to get rid of the inefficiencies, but don't think it's inefficiencies just caused by people ripping off the system. Uh, they, 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 there are also inefficiencies 
caused basically by the inadequate standards which local authorities are able to provide while they're in the present budgets. Thank you. Let's have some further questions. Yes, there's one, one there and uh, one at the back there. And have we got a third one? We'll, we, we take those two. So you mentioned the issue of dementia. Um, <coughs> local councils are planning for a big increase in dementia cases. Um, uh, and you, you mentioned there was a debate to be had there whether that was uh, um, an, uh, an affliction perhaps to be dealt with by NHS or was to be dealt by local authorities. Uh, I wonder if you could explore that a bit further. Uh, because frail elderly people have often complex medical needs um, dementia might be one of them, but other, there might be other causes. So um, um, could you just explore how society might deal through longevity of older people, many of whom will have dementia? Yeah. I, I, I might take... Do, would, would, would people mind if I just took that one and then take, take them one yeah. at a time? It is easier, because by the time... Otherwise, by the time I get to the third yeah. question, I've forgotten the fine detail of it. I mean, dementia is a terribly difficult issue. I mean, what's basically happened... Three in five people over the age of 80 have a degree of uh, dementia, co cognitive uh, failure, uh, it seems from the research. I mean, it may not be very grave, but it does exist. Um, on the one hand, this is, in a sense, clearly a disease, but it's a disease pretty well everyone's going to get as we live longer. I mean, the reason that dementia is rising is not that people are getting more dementia, it's that people aren't dying of all the other things that used to kill them off before they got um, dementia. There's nothing logically wrong with the demand that dementia care should be free where, um, yeah, where it's paid for at the moment. There's nothing logically wrong with it. It's just unbelievably expensive to go down uh, that line, which is why it would be resisted. You, these, these, the, the line between medical and social care is drawn sharply because one is free and the other isn't, but it isn't a sharp line at all. You can make for lots and lots of cases, and that's why there's all this case law, a case for something being one side or the other of that. And the, 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 the other crucial thing with dementia, though, is also comes back to, to the, not who pays for it, but the quality of services. I mean... I think we know much more than we did a few years ago about how to improve the lives of dementia pe people. And just putting glass, glass fronts on cupboards transforms the life of many people with dementia because they can remember where the plates are. And developing all that kind of thing is also absolutely crucial and specialist residential dementia homes. I don't know if any of you saw the series of documentaries on, I think it was, no, it wasn't Panorama. I can't remember which program it was. Anyway, there was a documentary which compared a home which was successfully dealing with dementia with a home that was not. And the home that was successfully dealing with dementia was giving its residents really very fulfilling lives and improving their quality. Um, Jewish Care, which is a very fine home in London, I've just been looking at their stuff on what they do for dementia patients now. And it's just wonderful things to remind them every day. They have a, um, an Austin standard car to remind people what cars used to be and that sort of thing. You know, it's, it's, it's marvellous. And there are places where they're just left to rot, and that is the most important thing, is that we, do, we improve on that. Uh, hello, thank you for a very interesting and provocative talk. Um, I'm, I'm a long-term carer, so I'm not caring for somebody who's elderly, but somebody who's disabled. Um, and obviously the issues are related most of the issues are in fact identical. Uh, and I think something that comes through in your talk and, and which I'd like to discuss a bit in detail um, because it takes us beyond the remit just of financing is the um, complexity of the problem as you've alluded to. And one of the things that concerns me is that not only is this an issue which is considered by national government but it is actually something which is delivered in event, eventually by local government uh, and then by communities and so on. And not only that, it spreads across departments of both social care but also health. Um, and so there's a great capacity for muddling. And as you also alluded, there are different levels of care. So, for example, whether or not a local authority is obliged to uh, deliver care for people who are both substantially and critically 
um, affected is, is also an issue which has just been contested in the courts in the last few days. Um, so there are all these possibilities for variation across the delivery of care and, and the kind of care that should be delivered and to whom. Uh, and I was wondering if I could ask you to try and sort of encompass all of this in what you might consider to be um, a better question for another commission, if you like, over and above the Dilnot Commission, which I, you know, having read their report, I agree, is obviously very um, comprehensive and, and is, is a good report. But, but what kind of question do you think a, co a commission should be asked uh, which actually dealt not just with the financing of these issues, but with all the other problems, as it were, that, that are encompassed in just the financing? Well, let me say I know a lot, a lot less about the organisation of it than I think I do about the, the funding of it. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert, really, in that field. Um, I think there's now quite a lot of... I'm not sure we want to commission because there's a great deal of agreement as to what's needed, seamless delivery of services, management of integrated management of multiple difficult long-term conditions. You know, there's a sort of rhetoric. Um, but many of the obstacles are institutional. In particular, nobody has cracked how you break down the divide between the health service and local authority services. Some, some people have joint joint funded programs and so on, but it's, it's extremely hard to um, get the two to work well together. And, you know, people being people, naturally, if you're providing the sort of social work service, you think that's terribly important, and the health service with its trying to patch people up together without, tr without treating them realistically is a complete failure. And if you're a health person, you can't say all this, why all this money's been worth talking about them when you could be giving them a hip replacement, and that would be doing the job. So these are very deep uh, things, and uh, ministers are terribly good at the rhetoric. We haven't yet had a minister who's really knocking the heads together, I think, and getting it, uh, trying to get it sorted. So as I say, I don't think it's a commission, but I think there is, you identify an extremely... Um, hard and difficult problem which which is crucial to a solution. The only caveat is that this is a bit like the waste thing. There's a tendency for people to say well we need to integrate long term care services better and that will save us lots of money and so we've solved the money problem we've solved the choices of resources and I fear it isn't like that. I mean, nearly everything in this field ends up costing money. And I don't think there's some simple solution to the, to the funding issues which we've been discussing uh, through saving money by better integration of long-term services. I mean, the case for it is that it makes people's lives better, which is in some ways more important. But I'm, I, I, I don't know the detail of how it's, how it's supposed to be done, so I may be wrong in all that. I'm just citing what other people tell me. I wonder if I could just ask you a more political question, really. You mentioned the House of Lords and its role um, uh, in sort of kiboshing, was it the Gordon Brown thing? I mean, is, this an, is, this, is the House of Lords, do you think, a particularly good forum for the discussion of these issues? I mean, obviously it's got a lot of elderly people in it. Well, it's intrinsically but, vastly superior to that other place down yeah, the corridor where they're pig ignorant of everything. <laughs> Apart from your um, <coughs> party free there, do you think it's uh, an area where... Our, um, you know, reform how a stronger House of Lords could have could bring about this long term. Well, we have a stronger House of Lords now. What the, mm. what the government's proposing is to make it into a weaker House, or at least a, a, a House of Lords that is a clone of the Commons, a weaker clone of the Commons, contains exactly the same kind of elected politicians. I mean, there are about a dozen to 15 people in the House of Lords who really know at least as much about this subject as I do. They may know different aspects of it. So, you know, Norman Warner, as I was, Labour people, we sort of slightly tend to specialise in different bits. Mm -hmm. But the, the degree of knowledge is very great. And the degree of knowledge in the House of Commons is not very great on this particular issue because for most of them it's simply not salient enough and it's too... You know, they've got other things to do than to learn, to spend, as I had to, a year learning up the whole subject. They've got all sorts of problems. So I think the House of Lords does make a huge uh, contribution in this sort of field. It's not quite as good as it was. When Labour was in power and they were therefore, we were outnumbered by the other two parties, we had to take account of the House of Lords. On the whole, the present government, because the Lib Dems and Conservatives outnumber Labour by 80, 
um, can force through anything that they're really determined to force through. And as long as the Lib Dems uh, are trying to wish to continue to show that they're better conservatives than the conservatives, that will continue. Sorry, I shouldn't make political points. But you know what I mean. Um, that will that will continue to be uh, to, to be so. Um, but um, I think I think the House of Lords has been a good force in this. And the, other, and the other thing is uh, that, of course, we will take a long view. We haven't got any electoral cycle to respond to, and therefore we're looking for solutions that will last and abide and be a, a memorial. So um, we've stopped bad things happening, and we've made some some good yeah. things happen. Yeah. Good. Um, any further questions? Or um, yes, gentlemen there. Um, just on the point that Ruth made about separating quality and the commissions on funding, I think it's quite difficult to separate them in some ways. The gentleman mentioned the change in cost between £8 and £15. I think most of that is to do with compliance. Since the Care Quality Commission came, and it's, I think, very prescriptive, and the local authorities have gone to being largely contractors rather than suppliers. So they can bring in regulations which they haven't then largely got to pay to upgrade their own services to. I just wondered if you thought um, it is the role of the state to set, be so prescriptive in setting standards of care. Though I'm sure they're all set um, with the best of intentions, but. Um, if uh, perhaps costs have gone up 30, 40% to comply with these regulations, I'm not sure if that's, I don't know if they've done any research, but whether that actually provide, has proved to be good value for money. I'm thinking particularly in the home care sector. Well, we've made a complete cock up of regulation. In this sector, I mean, I happen to think that it is better for the providers to be in the private sector commission from a local authority. That, on the whole, is better than, than than the local authorities providing things themselves. And this is borne out by the research into uh, residential homes carried out by the audit commission. I'm going to oversimplify this part because it's 10 years since or a number of years since I read it. But basically, it showed there wasn't any difference in quality of homes in the private sector and the public sector, except that on average the public sector ones cost £100 a week per resident more to run. And that's money we just haven't got. But the things that have happened on regulation are enough to have you, you make one cry. I mean, if you followed The Guardian this week, you'll have read about some of them. For example, a proposal was brought out that the minimum size of a room in which two old people could share in residential care should increase from 10 square yards to 10 square metres, because we live in Europe now and it has to be metres. That meant that throughout the, lots of the, throughout the country, residential homes were going to have to lose one resident because their rooms were 10 square yards and they couldn't just knock the, knock the outside walls down to increase them to 10 square metres. And they were liable to go bankrupt in huge numbers. Now, actually, that was a case where uh, a House of Lords campaign did succeed, at least in postponing the new regulation. But this was some madness dreamt up by regulators who have simply hadn't given any attention to it. The actual regulatory scene has been frightful, including the abolition of one, the announcement of the abolition of one regulator 17 days after it had been set up. And the final fiasco was the bringing together of three regulators, um, the mental health, um, social care, sorry, Ruth, remind me what the other one was anyway, the three regulators into one, the, into the Quality Care Commission, because that was because the government had the idea at the moment, at the time, that you, bigger organisations were more efficient, and you, at the same time, they cut the number of inspectors they have. Well, that's why we're getting this series of scandals about the Quality Care Commission failing to, uh, to um, find scandals. The number of inspectors has been cut. But when the Quality Care Commission should have been struggling with these issues, it wasn't. They were fighting between three organisations as to who took got one what job. Um, one uh, chairman was chair was sacked in this. Poor old Joe Williams has left been left with the baby to try and sort <coughs> out. The regulation has deteriorated seriously as a result of mindless uh, ministerial intervention. I mean, for God's sake, we do mostly know how to regulate now. There's a perfectly good body of doctrine 
about how regulation of this sort of thing should be carried out. And yet it doesn't happen. Madness. Well, it's um, uh, nearly quarter past um, seven now, and we've got it's a, a taxi. Um, it, 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 there was a lady there. Just, just time for one, one last one, but if, it's, if we can do it quickly, yeah. Thank you. I, th I think we've indeed debated some major issues, the boundaries between health and, and social care, quality and care provision, difficulties of, of regulation, and the overall cost of providing services to, to a range of people in difficult economic times. What I'm concerned about is that the bill for that shouldn't fall at the feet of older people in particular. Uh, and I think that we need to broaden the discussion in terms of citizenship and human rights and look at holistic solutions to these problems and say, should people at all ages contribute to the cost of the care? Why should older people, for example, have to mortgage themselves to move into care home accommodation, which on the whole, they don't choose to do, they are forced to do by a variety of of medical conditions and difficult social circumstances. But people in middle age continue to have free access to NHS services or indeed maternity okay. services and such like. Are, are we focusing in a slightly ageist way on, on older people? Well, I, I, I take the point you're making, but I don't wholly agree with it because what I think is, is apparent from is that uh, older people are now vastly better off. They used to be, it used to be if you're old, you're poor, if you're 75 plus, you're very poor. What's changed? Number one, um, home ownership, up around 70%, something about that for older people, giving, them, giving most older people uh, a very substantial resource. Number two, political bribery, free TV licenses, uh, for the over 75s, the winter fuel allowance, which my wife and I get and send straight off to, to, to charity, um, free prescriptions for over 65s. Why should some young family have to, uh, family have to pay for it when they may be really not very well off? Um, and rich, um, older people with you know, 1.4 million pound pension pot get their prescriptions entirely uh, free. I mean, there's a very good book by David Willits. Um, I, know, I know it's probably not a name to mention in, in an institute of higher education, but his book um, explaining how the elderly have, have improved their position, particularly as it were the young elderly, the sort of people between 65 and 80. Um, there is no way, this is the second thing I'm going to make, you're going to get 40-year-olds, 30-year-olds in the peak of their family life providing for their care when they're old. The time it has to be done is around about retirement age when people have seen what's happening to their parents going into homes and say, I must prevent this happening to myself. And that's the time when they need to do their, their planning and make their moves. You're just not going to get the, the younger people paying more than they are towards the support of the elderly population, in my view. Well, thanks very much. Well, David, um, you described this uh, long-term care for the elderly is an unpleasant topic, uh, certainly a difficult one and a wicked one, but I think you've definitely made it a very fascinating one in your, 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 your talk. You've, you've, you've really addressed the problem with tremendous clarity. You've, you've really elucidated the issues, the, the, the funding issues, the political issues, the social issues, the organisational issues. And there's so many kind of spin-offs too 